Would you please take your Bible or perhaps take one from the pew in front of you and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, and we're going to read together part of the text that is printed in the worship folder, and the other part we'll take next week. 13, 7 through 12 this morning, and then we'll repeat some of this and finish on into verse 16 next week, and then after that there'll be, Lord willing, two more weeks, and we'll be done with Hebrews, if you can believe it. After two years together in this book, it feels nostalgic to me. Let's read together verses 7 through 12. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by varied, strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, but not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. That is, they're not eaten. They're burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Father, as I begin to unfold these verses, I ask for your help now, that you would come and protect me from error or any unbiblical imbalance in emphasis or focus, protect me from any fear of man or pride or insensitivity, and grant to this people hearts and minds that are alive and awake and alert and docile and soft and touchable and changeable according to truth. In Jesus' name I pray for your help. Amen. Last week, if you were here, if you weren't, I'll just bring you up to speed. We looked at the paragraph just before this one. In verses 1 to 6, and there we saw that we are to love one another. We are to show hospitality to strangers. We are to visit and care for prisoners and ill-treated people. We are to keep our marriage vows. And we are to uh, not love money. And all of that, not in the power of our own self, nor our own ingenuity, but in the power of the promise of verse 5. I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. Therefore, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Therefore, I will not love money. Therefore, I will keep my marriage vows. Therefore, I will visit prisoners. Therefore, I will welcome strangers. Therefore, I will love one another. You see where the normal, radical Christian life comes from? It comes from promises. It comes from faith in promises. That was last week's point. It's the point of the book of Hebrews. I believe it's the point of the Bible. Living by faith in future grace is the power that transforms our lives. It takes strength. Now with this I move. That's a key word I'm picking up now from today's text. It takes strength to love each other when there's nursery stresses. It takes strength to get the suffering of a prisoner into your life, which already has enough suffering, right? There are no more resources, thank you. Call somebody else for that ministry. It takes strength 
to welcome strangers when you don't know what strangers are going to bring to your life. It takes strength to keep your marriage vows when the dreams are not at all what you thought they were going to be. And it's just plain frustrating. It takes strength to turn away from the promises that money makes to you. We're talking strength here now. So let's go and look for it in today's text. Because the point of today's text is that strength is offered to us. Where it comes from is told to us. And how to keep it and keep it stoked is in this text. So let's jump to verse 9. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings... For it is good for the heart to be strengthened. There's the key word I've latched on to. It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. Now, get very clear. The strength being spoken of here is strength of heart, not Body. The heart, I believe in this context, is the you that is not material. The you that loves. The you that gets angry. The you that grieves over a lost loved one. The you that makes decisions. The you that's happy or sad. The you that is you that's not the body. The you that will go to heaven when you die or hell when you die. I think that's what this is talking about. It's the same thing that Paul meant in Ephesians 3.16 when he prayed, I bow my knees before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that you might be strengthened according to the riches of his glory through his Spirit in the inner man. Strengthened in the inner person. That's the you that's not material. It's not this stuff. It's not the seeing with physical eyes or the talking with the physical tongue or the hearing with physical ears. It's it's the you that has all these desires and longings and yearnings and hurts and hopes and pains and joys. That you should be strengthened. needs to be strong, according to this verse 9. It says... It is good for the heart to be strengthened. So let me ask you, are you strong? We're not talking muscles, right? Not talking your electrocardiogram even. Not that heart. We're not talking cholesterol or PSA count. We're talking you. When you strip away all the front of the makeup, the hairdo, the physique, the gait, when all that's gone, you are you strong. Joe Hallett died of AIDS and lived 11 years miraculously with AIDS was a magnificent testimony to the grace of God in deliverance and was incredibly weak especially in recent years physically and there was one strong person strong person so get real clear here the kind of strength we're talking about and what the heart is in verse 9 It is good for the heart to be strengthened. Let me change the question. Instead of just asking, are you, your your humility might move you to say, I'm weak. Fine. Let me ask this question. Do you want to be strong? Do you want to be strong? Now, when I read verse 9 and it says, it is good for the heart to be strengthened. If I, putting myself in your shoes right now, hearing me ask that question, if I were to say, oh, no, I don't really want to be strong, I would say, well, that's disobedient because it says it's good for the heart to be strengthened. 
So I think you should want to be strong this morning. When you hear me say this, you should be sitting there, no matter how weak you feel on the inside, you should be saying, okay, I hear it, it's the Bible, it's not just Pastor John, the Bible says it's good for my heart to be strengthened, therefore, before this service is over, I would like to be strengthened. I would like that. And just whisper a prayer, God, do that, do that. If it's the will of God revealed in verse 9, do it. Do it for me. I came in very weak. I don't feel like a strong person. My heart feels like it's going to break or is so tired or so confused or so full of doubts or whatever. I don't. I couldn't say, yes, I'm strong. Just say now, okay, it's good to be strengthened. I want to be strengthened. Help me be strengthened. And then listen and see if God might strengthen you. Verse 9 tells us where to turn for it. So let's turn. It says, turn to grace, not food. Let's read it. Do not be carried away with varied and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. Through which those who were so occupied with foods were not benefited. Now, evidently, let's try to put the pieces together here. Evidently, something's going on in this church that could be called strange and diverse teachings relating to foods. Right? That's not reading too much in, is it? Don't be carried away by these strange teachings as though the heart could be strengthened by Foods and not by grace. Now, I don't know what the strange teaching was. And I don't think anybody knows. And I'm sort of glad we don't know. Because that frees us now to just meditate on the strange teachings that are around today concerning foods. And then not have anybody say, yeah, but that's not what we're talking about in the Bible. You don't know. So I'm just going to throw up a few yellow flags here. There are religious food regimens and there are secular food regimens that people turn to sometimes obsessively to find hope and strength. For example, religious food regimens. The first one that comes to mind is fasting. Anybody know any books on fasting? (laughs) Beware. Tom Steller said, Oh, this comes almost as close to being the best first line in your book as the missions book. Beware of books on fasting. It's the first line in the book. It's not an accident. Beware of people that come to you with food regimens to fix your life including fasting, or sacramentalism. If you just take the Lord's Supper the right number of times from the right person, you get enough grace to carry on. Or vegetarianism. Before the fall, they didn't eat meat. If you get back to paradise, you won't ruin your body. And you'll be more spiritually fit. This meat stuff is what's ruined everybody's life. Or there are a lot of secular routines, food supplements, vitamins, antioxidants, organic diets, fat-free, sugar-free, caffeine-free, chemical-free. And sometimes, not all the time, okay? A little little parenthesis to bail me out here. I got up this morning... And with a flare, went to the counter in front of my wife and daughter and put eight big fat vitamin tablets in my hand and swallowed them down and said to Noel, vitamins are going to take a hit in church this morning, so I'm free. (laughs) You get it? They're not the answer, folks. And sometimes, 
these things become obsessive and subtly the regimen of food starts to make promises and you start to live by those promises and hope in those promises and build your life around those promises. If I eat right, fast right, my life will be happy and I'll be strong. And verse 9 says, It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace and not by foods. It's an alien teaching. And so I just say, beware. Beware. I don't know what the teaching was. Rather positively, be strengthened by grace. Learn. Let's learn now, in the next few minutes, how to be strengthened in this desire factory called our heart. Let's learn how to be strengthened by grace. Okay? How do you do it? If you don't eat food as the answer to your weakness, how do you eat grace? You wake up in the morning and you feel guilty, dirty, some ugly thing you said the night before to somebody, some neglected good deed you knew you should have done, or you feel like a failure, your job has just gone so bad you get one slip after the other. So failure, guilt, defilement, what do you do? Well, the alien teaching says, eat a good breakfast and take some good vitamins and get some sugar in your blood and, if necessary, caffeine and get out in the light. That's the best the world can do. Tack on a few psychological regimens to go with it. And God says to this person lying in bed, feeling so dirty and such a failure they don't want to get out of bed, get your heart strengthened by grace. On a morning like this, eat grace for breakfast. Eat grace for breakfast. How? Well, let's go to verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So he's talking about eating still. Hasn't left the issue of this false teaching that's trying to fix people with food. We have an altar which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Now, what in the world is he talking about? What's the altar? Who are these people who have no right to eat? Why don't they have a right to eat? What's the food? This is a very opaque verse. I think he means this. Those who serve the tabernacle are the priests in Jerusalem, or historically, who made sacrifices and who in this case have rejected Jesus as their Messiah and can you continue right on making sacrifices even though those sacrifices all pointed to Jesus as the end point, the fulfillment, the completion of that whole sacrificial system is Jesus and he has died once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and so these folks that are still doing that in Jerusalem have no right to eat at our altar. Which is what? The cross. The last sacrifice was sacrificed on the altar outside the city, the cross of Jesus. And when he was sacrificed, a banquet was spread of what? Not meat, not foods, grace. And so if you want to eat grace, you go to the altar which is Christ crucified for our sins. 
And that's where we eat. And so as you lie there in bed and you feel filthy because of the ugliness of the previous day and you feel like a failure because of the grade you got or because of the way business is going or because of the way you let some relationship down or because of some nasty thing somebody said to you, the only hope this text offers is not food. You see, don't, don't do this with food. Do this with grace. Go to the altar. Go to the cross. We have an altar, it says, namely the crucified Christ. Now, verse 11, what, what is, he goes on and he, he unpacks this a little further because he's thinking of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. This writer knows his Old Testament and unpacks it for all it's worth. Let me give you the background for verse 11. In, on the, in the Day of Atonement, this is one day a year in the Jewish calendar where a bull and a goat, actually two goats, but one of them was a scapegoat and was let go in the wilderness, but two of them were killed. The blood was taken from the bull and the goat, was taken by the priest into the tent, then into the Holy of Holies. The blood was sprinkled on the ark to cover the sins of all the people that they'd committed that year. He walks out and they take the bodies of the bull and the goat and unlike other sacrifices they don't eat them they take them outside the camp and burn them up and this writer reads that and says hmm 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 what's that about any any meaning there for Jesus and what he concludes is this on the day of atonement When the decisive sacrifice of a bull and a goat are offered and the blood is sprinkled, the only thing to eat is forgiveness and hope. No meat. No meat this time. The meat goes outside the camp and gets burned up. So the point is, on the Day of Atonement, you don't come to God for food except the food of grace. The food of hope, the food of forgiveness, which is the food we really need. Now, verse 12, I mean, verse. let's read verse 11 so you see that. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Now, verse 12, he makes a comparison here. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. In other words, here's the way I think his mind is working. He's saying, the Day of Atonement was all pointing toward the last and final sacrifice of Jesus. It was a day in which when the sacrifice was made and the blood was shed, there was no eating of the sacrifice except the benefits of forgiveness and hope that come through forgiveness. So Jesus, like those animals, were burned up outside the gate. He got consumed by suffering outside the gate. A baptism of fire and conflagration consumed him outside the gate. And there's where our meal is prepared. And it isn't meat. It isn't food. It's grace. So when you wake up and you feel rotten, guilty, like a failure... Don't say, what I need is a pancake. (laughs) Eggs, granola, coffee, caffeine. In fact, I'll just do a little survey here without having you embarrass yourselves by raising your hand. How many of you and how often do you find yourself at work looking back on the morning's routine, knowing that you skipped the breakfast of grace in order to eat the breakfast of toast and said to your conscience, I didn't have time to read my Bible and go to the altar of God and feed on grace. Because I know what God would say. He would say, you ate your toast. Hmm. 
I don't get it. What do you mean? You didn't have time. You ate your toast. It's just a matter of priorities, folks. I speak here from some some years of experience. I'm 51. I'm starting to feel like talking like I've got lots of experience. I'll wait maybe another 10 years before I say that. I, I speak of from some experience here. There are many mornings in my life when the breakfast of grace is my only means of survival. We're talking survival in the ministry, in the marriage, as a parent. And to pass on the breakfast of granola is no achievement. It's just desperation. I ate lunch with Tom Steller yesterday. He's back for a day from Wheaton. And we were getting each other up to date. And I was talking about Joe and his death and Danny and his death and the four or five of you that are struggling with cancer right now and the stresses of those kinds of things. And we looked each other in the face and smiled and said, This is the greatest work in the world. Because it's desperate work. A leader has to have a strong heart because people come to you with hard questions about theology. They come to you with absolutely mind-boggling perplexities of life, needing wisdom. They come to you with unbelievable brokenness, needing healing. They come to you with anger about the way things are going in the church or in their lives and need an ear that doesn't return evil for evil. Where, I ask you, Does anybody get resources for that relentless drainage? And the answer is, we have an altar. We have a table. We have no choice. We have to be strong. And you know what? You do too. You're a minister. Small groups, folks, just to mention one opportunity. Last week, 275 of you signed up, and we'll get you connected. But that means, in addition to the two or 300 who had already been in small groups, there are, what, four or 500 of you who, at least as far as we know, are not connected with a small group. That's one place to minister and be ministered to. And we're all ministers, and therefore we all need strength of heart, morning after morning, to get out of bed, to get dressed, to go to work, is sometimes huge. And then to have a small group meeting and to look into each other's faces and say, I'm here for you. How can I pray for you? How are you doing? That takes strength of heart. And we have an altar. We have an altar. Jesus Christ's grace. Let me let me close with just a few more observations from the verses I've skipped over in verses 7 and 8. I love this writer. That's why I sort of feel nostalgic about leaving him behind in a few weeks because he loves me so much. God in him loves you. He really loves you because he wants you not only to come to your altar to get grace, to get out of bed and feel clean, to feel hopeful and helped. He wants you to have Ways and strategies to connect with that grace. And so in verse 7 he says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This writer really believed in heroes. Models. Remember chapter 11? 
All the heroes of faith, same thing here. Not only remember that you've got an altar outside the city where Christ was consumed and looks up off that roasted cross into your eyes to say, I love you. You're forgiven for my name's sake. We also are to remember leaders who spoke to us the word of God. In other words, know some history. A little short-term history maybe. Parents. Pastors, missionaries that you know, know some history. If it's only 20 years worth, know some. Because the Bible says to remember. Sometimes people ask me, how come you do these biographies during the pastor's conference? 11 years. I've done a biography every pastor's conference in January or February. Why do you do those, Pastor John? We hear you start reading in... The prior June, every spare minute I have, I read Augustine now, because I'm going to lecture on Augustine in February. Why do you do that? And the answer is not because it's interesting, though it is. The answer is because the Bible says, let's read it, remember those who led you and spoke the word of God to you. And frankly, I get most of my word for God, of God, from dead people. I don't hear anybody else preach most of the time. And the books that have been written by living people, I don't find all that helpful most of the time. Remember them and look at what? What does it say to look at? Be careful here now. Does it say to look at their conduct? Not quite. It's more precise and we've got to get this. It says, when you remember them, it says, look at the result, or maybe your version says outcome. Literally, it is, uh, look carefully at the exit of their way of life. I think it means beware of living heroes and prefer dead ones. Because it's the outcome of conduct that counts. Beware. Now, my word beware does not mean forsake and abandon and give up on. It means beware of living heroes. You know why? Twenty years into their ministry, they commit adultery. That's why. Thirty years, and they're off with their secretary. Right? So beware of John Piper. Beware of anybody else who stands as a a leader in front of you and has in front of him perhaps another ten or twenty or thirty years to prove whether he's real. This text says... When you get a hero, especially look at the exit. Which simply means go back to chapter 11 and 12 and watch them run in their course. Go ahead, have some living ones and watch them as they come to the end of their course and pray like crazy that they make it. Finish well, John. Finish well, Joe. Finish well, Dan. Finish well, Patty. We're behind you. Oh, God, let us finish well. Those are the heroes we want. I love my father, Bill Piper, 78 years old, strong, devoted, soul winning, making tapes, grading tests for third world people. And I tremble at the thought that he might not finish well. I think he will. But it is not guaranteed. At 78, it's not guaranteed. And therefore, get heroes and especially get dead ones who have all the way gone, looked it right in the face and said, I rest in you. A great song that they sang as they went out onto the beach there in Ecuador 
the five of them who were killed in 1956. One last thing I see here for us to help us. What does he tell us to imitate when we look at their conduct and its outcome in a faithful death? What does he tell us to imitate? Tell me the word. Faith, not conduct. Now I stress this as we close because you know what imitating conduct produces? Fakes. Camouflage. Christians. Decoys. And I don't want that for myself. There is something behind conduct that makes it real or makes it hypocritical. And it's faith. That was the point of last week's message. The faith in the promise that I'll never leave you or forsake you frees the conduct of not loving money, keeping your marriage vows, visiting the prisoners, having people into your home, loving one another. That's the conduct. Don't try to imitate that without faith. You become a hypocrite. And the fearful thing in the Christian church is that you can do it so easily, especially if you grow up in it. Right? Yikes! Growing up in the church is a dangerous thing. Because you can look around, you can learn the hymns, you can learn when to sit and when to stand and how not to lie and how to tell the truth and how to work hard to make a living and take on the Judeo-Christian ethic and make yourself a successful American and go straight to hell and be the deacon chairman on the way. And it's so scary. Therefore, I plead with you, get a motor. With your car. And if your motor isn't making your car go, get off the highway. Because your life is only going to be more miserable in hell for all the time you spent hobnobbing with Christian people. Imitate faith this morning. We're going to close now. We're going to close. And my heart's desire is that those of you who are believers will have learned a little more how to feed on grace. When I wake up in the morning and I feel guilty and I feel like a failure, I need two kinds of grace, not just one. I need the, the forgiving grace of the cross... So I go to the altar, I go to the cross, and I look at Jesus. But I need more than that. I need more than forgiveness. I need the assurance that the Jesus who did that and loved me that much is alive at 1156 on the 21st of September to help me finish the next one minute of this message and get me through this afternoon and two funerals in the next two weeks and to be a parent for this little girl until she's up and gone. I need some assurances that he is going to be there for me. And that's why verse 8 is so powerful. Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and forever. You know the point of that verse? The point of that verse is the grace of the cross, which is infinite in magnitude in declaring the love that Jesus has for us, is the same magnitude of love and power and grace with which he stands right here. Right now. And tomorrow. And every tomorrow after that. I need that. When I get out of bed in the morning. I need to know he's going to church with me this morning. Let's pray. Lord.
I pray for those two great kinds of grace to just come like a great river through the hearts of your people here. And that people who walked into this room not trusting grace, but trusting food or self would be swept into the river of grace. Past grace of forgiveness, future grace of help. Lord, save people right now and strengthen our hearts, I pray.